thanks for coming. Uh, it's always great to come out and, uh, and talk with you guys about some things that uh, I hold near and dear to my heart and my, my entire being. I was a newspaper reporter. I started journalism in high school. And I worked at a big daily newspaper in Ohio for about 40 years before I came back to Syracuse to go to law school. And uh, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> Cam, 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 baby doll. The mic. Mic's on. Mic is on. Maybe pick it up. Oh, Tony, you're hearing it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to speak into it a little. Is that better? No. Is this better? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, as I as I said, uh, I choose this. Don't let them talk to their nuts. Yes. Hold your tail, though. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, evangelized for a lapel mic, a portable lapel mic. I need somebody to give me five hundred bucks to get it done. <laughs> so I'll be at the door with my hand out, <laughs> so we can make the mic better here. And we can have two or three of them so we can enlarge the presentation. Go back. Okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, so I pretty much owe my, my entire professional life to, to the First Amendment because I wouldn't have been able to be a reporter, I wouldn't be able to be a, a lawyer or a professor, and I wouldn't be able to shoot my mouth off and write for the Post Standard all the time if we didn't have these protections. Um, so I, I, do, uh, I do appreciate uh, uh, what we're going to talk about today. Um, Lewis, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm diversely audited this year by the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the things that I've been writing, but uh, we still have something else to write about if, if that happens. Um, but there's easy pickets. That's true. Yeah, but uh, there are people who make a lot more than me, hiding a lot more than I could ever hide. <laughs> I'll not be audited. And, um, you know, current events do uh, dictate some of what we talk about, and especially in my classes on the First Amendment. So our current events will probably dictate a little of where we go, uh, at least with the questions today. Uh, today's New York Times is a wonderful example of the power of the press and the power of the protections under the First Amendment. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of fallout there is from, from those stories that detail our president's uh, financial background. So uh, it is uh, kind of uh, interesting times we live in right now. And, um, and hopefully we can talk a little about some other current event issues, perhaps the uh, Controversy with the uh, Supreme Court nomination. Um, I was I, I was thinking of changing my name to Bart O. Gutterman. <laughs> That's just too obvious. I don't necessarily think I need the comparison either. Where were you on the night of? <laughs> I, I'll be happy to produce my high school calendars, <laughs> which have no admissions of crime in them. So. You'll have to ask Bart if you're really Bart. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, we have to laugh at some of this or else we'd be crying our way to sleep. So, yeah, exactly. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll play around with some of this as well. Um, but primarily, I, I, I would like to focus on two aspects of uh, press issues these days. Uh, we're going to talk a little about defamation and the protections that we, that we have. Uh, from liability for defamation. And the other issue we're gonna talk about will be issues of uh, reporter privilege and confidentiality, the so-called confidential source or anonymous source <coughs> that so much of uh, recent uh, press has been based on with Woodward and the uh, anonymous column in the, the New York Times a couple weeks ago. So if you have questions, I'm happy to, to entertain questions as we go along. If you've got comments, I'm a free speech absolutist, so if you want to trash me, go for it. <laughs> uh, I've got pretty thick skin, although I will admit that I do not read the comments in the, uh, in the Post Standard. I've been uh, encouraged not to read them, so uh, we move on that way. So I've got a couple of short films that uh, I produced in the last couple of years that I think highlight a couple of these issues. They're kind of fun. 
It's only two and a half minutes, so we'll start with this one and uh, see how it goes. Open up those libel laws, folks, and we're gonna have people sue you like you never got sued before. I think it's very concerning that we have an executive branch now that is attacking the press relentlessly and trying to make them into the enemy uh, and has talked about, for example, you know, complete revision of the libel law that has been in place since the 1960s. The only real way to go after the libel laws is to overturn New York Times against Sullivan. In the 1960s, Civil rights leaders ran a full-page ad in the New York Times to raise funds for the civil rights movement. L.B. Sullivan, the Montgomery, Alabama city commissioner, felt the ad damaged his reputation and sued the New York Times. In a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the New York Times, stating that in order to prove libel, a public official must show that the publication acted with actual malice. I think it's very scary that, that he is both tacking on a daily basis and then sort of trying to figure out how to get rid of the, those key protections that have been in place since New York Times versus Sullivan. And the only way to do that is to appoint Supreme Court justices who are prepared to do that. Judge Neil Gorsuch, his Supreme Court nominee, has written in the opposite direction. I think the real problem is what about the publication of truthful government secrets that could inform a democracy, but go against the espionage laws, which on their face apply to journalists as much as to, uh, to, to, to whistleblowers. At some point, we're going to have to start looking at whether or not there are, we're going to do something about suppression of expression by private actors. You know, as, as our modes of expression get more and more controlled by the Facebooks and Googles of the world, that, that becomes an issue as well to the extent that they're censoring content on a daily basis in social media something else that we have to look at. So, <clears throat> so aside from the, the hyperbole of being able to change our libel laws, which I, I know we probably have some lawyers in the room and some historians in the room, obviously a, an overstatement of presidential power, a misstatement of presidential power. Uh, as you know, libel is uh, the law that protects our reputations from false statements of fact. And um, the Sullivan case, which uh, really was set in the backdrop of the civil rights uh, movement, uh, and in many ways can be just as much a case about civil rights as it is uh, defamation, um, <clears throat> really sets a, a, a standard that is um, that really sets us apart from the rest of the world. That public officials, and people who work for government, it was later expanded to public figures, people with power and uh, authority and access, that these entities are going to have to prove an additional you know, step of actual malice, which is a, a term of art that's kind of misunderstood. It really just means publishing something knowing it was false or in, uh, with reckless disregard for the truth, which is a level of irresponsibility that is almost never seen uh, by the media. So, you know, it's interesting. In many other countries, uh, people, you know, the kings, the, 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 the monarchs, and the people that run the government have additional protections where it becomes a crime to criticize them. Whereas in the United States, it's protected and encouraged. Justice Brennan, in the, who, the, the principal, the author of the, the Sullivan opinion, really takes uh, you know, bold steps in talking about the role of the press, the role of even false information, exaggerated information. And he traces it all the way back to Madison, and there's a great quote in the, in the opinion, uh, quoting Madison that says, you know, some degree of abuse is inseparable from everything in a democracy, and it's uh, especially important with freedom of the press. I'm paraphrasing and mangling the quote a little, but some degree of abuse is inseparable. Welcome to politics. 
leaders, this is this is what you uh, have to <coughs> endure to a certain extent. And I'm not sure our current leadership really understood that or wants to understand that. I don't want to get I don't want to turn this into a whole <coughs> complaint about our current administration, although it's probably uh, an undercurrent in just about everything we talk about these days, but it, cu it cuts both ways. Um, the, the press exists under the First Amendment to criticize politicians of both parties. And there are famous stories of Bill Clinton meeting with the uh, publisher of the New York Times, and Bill Clinton, who was you know, favored, you know, pretty much favored by uh, members of the media, complained that the press was treating him too harshly as well. So it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, I mean, you know, perhaps some some of our leaders might have a, a better understanding of that. But you know, why do we even have these? We call them protections. It goes back to the origins of the First Amendment, and our historians <laughs> probably have a lot to say on that. But you know, our First Amendment was passed in an era of uh, intense censorship. Seditious libel was still on the books, and in some states, it's criminal libel still on the books, but it's not really enforced even today. But you know, this concern that we could, that our press could be censored or punished simply for criticizing truthful aspects um, that the government doesn't it doesn't like, and you know, it's a it's a rude awakening to be on the receiving end of that. I would presume. I, I mean, nobody likes to be criticized, but Part of part of the political process as well, uh, especially when you look at uh, uh, when you have one party that's dominating both houses, the presidency and the courts. So essentially, we're we're living in a, a unique time where we really don't have an opposition, a political opposition. So who's going to be the opposition? Our fourth estate, the press, uh, which is protected under under our. First Amendment, and even even looking at the First Amendment, for the first hundred years of, of, of constitutional law, the First Amendment really wasn't uh, applied or enforced or really articulated too much, and even when it was, it was really looked at as an anti-censorship protection, okay, that the government can't come in and engage in, in censorship, and we've moved uh, pretty far um, in, in the application, and it's expanded to uh, our protections for criticism and dissent and, uh, and, and a broad range of, of free speech and speech issues. So um, I, we can really thank Times B. Sullivan for a lot of that. We can thank Justice Brennan for uh, putting these protections in place for, uh, for us. And again, the video, it's not even a year old. It's already outdated because we've gotten the change uh, with uh, Justice Kennedy retiring. And um, you know, we're sort of on edge now because we don't know where you know, future Justice Kavanaugh is going to sit on um, at least these types of First Amendment issues. Uh, he's sort of, he doesn't have a long history uh, of um, First Amendment analysis and First Amendment uh, protection, um, and it'll be interesting to see how he uh, would view a press clause case after being uh, dragged through the mud ostensibly by the press. So uh, he would sometimes these justices who get on the court after a bruising uh, confirmation hearing sort of hold grudges against the, the media. Is it true that he didn't even uh, try a case before he had the judgeship? That's um, what I read yesterday. Uh, that I don't know. But Say that again. The question is whether uh, Kavanaugh had tried a case as a federal judge or as a lawyer. As a lawyer. Um, I, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. I, I know plenty of lawyers who haven't actually tried a case, <laughs> especially with his background going from his clerkships into government service, it's highly unlikely that he actually tried a case. But I'd have to, I'd have to read up a little more on that. So, um, you know, if 
Adam Liptak, who was interviewed uh, in my video, did mention Justice Gorsuch. And Gorsuch did have a, a, a record specifically on Times B. Sullivan, and he's, he wrote at least one opinion supporting the Times B. Sullivan holding. So at least Gorsuch might be uh, sort of uh, on the uh, First Amendment side with the press. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see how um, Justice Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, will uh, react to if, if there is a press case. There hasn't been a press case uh, in about 20 years, and even the, the one case wasn't really a, a straight press case. So most of the First Amendment cases that have been coming up in the court over the last uh, few terms have really focused on broadening speech rights, usually political speech, <coughs> and usually for um, people on the political right who feel that their viewpoints are being uh, uh, punished, censored, or discriminated against. And most recently, there was the, case, the, the Masterpiece Case, Ma Masterpiece Kate case out of uh, Colorado, which, came, which sort of merged aspects of uh, freedom of religion with freedom of speech in allowing a, um, a baker not to sell a cake, a designer cake to a, a gay couple. And uh, he argued that his free speech rights were being uh, ignored and his religious rights were being ignored by being compelled to, uh, by a, the Colorado Human Rights Commission to make a cake and sell it to a gay couple. So we see that uh, Justice Kagan had, had uh, spoken on this, and she said it was the weaponizing of the First Amendment. And that's been a term that's been uh, bandied around uh, in recent months and years, where uh, speakers are using the First Amendment to you know, have their, their voices, their political voices, uh, heard even louder. And um, I mean, it's an interesting concept. Uh, really, the First Amendment is really a, a nonpartisan issue, should be a nonpartisan issue. And it's interesting when you go back and look at uh, First Amendment free speech cases from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, it was people on the political left who were being censored and punished and uh, using, their, using the First Amendment to try to protect themselves. And now it's the complete opposite. It's people on the political right who feel that they, that, that they need to assert their First Amendment rights to get their viewpoints protected. And um, you know, it's interesting how these things evolve. So uh, I want to now shift over to uh, my confidentiality video. Is this all on your own website? This is uh, tully.syr.edu. I'll, I'll repeat it later <coughs> as well. Anyway, I've got six of these videos. So. Why should you have a right to turn down a grand jury subpoena? Aren't you a citizen of the United States and don't you want to obey the law? Raspberry v. Hayes is the only uh, case the Supreme Court has taken that uh, deals with whether a reporter has to disclose his confidential sources. Paul Bransberg of the Louisville Courier Journal wrote two articles concerning drug use in Kentucky, relying on unidentified sources, and Bransberg was subpoenaed before a grand jury to name his sources. The court essentially said that there was no privilege for a reporter, and the reporter did have to answer questions such as who your source was uh, on the stand. Lots of lawyers persuaded lots of judges that Justice Powell's concurring opinion was the critical document because it was a five to four case. The court does not hold that newsmen subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury are without constitutional rights with respect to the gathering of news or in safeguarding their sources. There are a lot of cases where this comes up. I mean, papers, newspapers, TV stations get subpoenaed a fair amount of time. But the big cases that get our attention 
generally are, are the national security leak cases, uh, such as my client, Judy Miller, who ended up going to jail for 85 days. I am a citizen of the United States. I do want to obey the law. Uh, but the problem is, uh, they're under our laws, are whole categories of people who are exempt from appearing before grand juries. Journalists, too, have a very specific and important function in society, and that is as the people who kind of live day to day the First Amendment, who help bring the public news and that in order to do that, we rely heavily on confidential sources, and therefore, in order to do our jobs, we have to be able to protect the people who come to us with sensitive and potentially dangerous information for them and for their careers. You know, we fought it uh, as hard as we could, uh, even knowing that we had both kind of bad facts and bad law, but the only alternative would, be, would have been to have her testify, and that really was intolerable to her. So, uh, the law is uh, unclear at the moment. The, uh, the trend isn't good, I would say. We almost had a federal shield law. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks came along just around the time that Congress was considering it. And the notion that a uh, foreign, politically, so culturally anti-American uh, 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 individual who seemed not to be taking into account American national security interests at all would be absolved from responsibility, not have to reveal their sources, was unacceptable to Congress. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. And um, as a former reporter, I can tell you that one of the one of my best sources was somebody I never once quoted. <coughs> and again, I wasn't covering national security issues in Northern Ohio, um, and I wasn't under <coughs> fear that I was going to be subpoenaed by a special prosecutor or a, a federal grand jury. But it always raised the question, and I, I raise this question with stu journals and students all the time, who want to talk about using confidential sources, sometimes called anonymous sources. But I don't like the I don't like the use of the term anonymous sources because the reporter knows who they're talking to. The reporter always knows, and then you know it becomes a you know, an assessment, a credibility issue. So the reporter knows who they're talking to. They just don't publicize that. And, press or on TV or, or uh, wherever they're publishing. So you know, the concern that a, uh, a reporter might be roped into a, a grand jury situation and then uh, be forced with this dilemma. And what's the, what, are the, you know, what are the two sides of this? One side is spill the beans, reveal your source, and let your source spend for him or herself and either face prosecution or scrutiny, or um, extrajudicial uh, problems, right? Again, some of these confidential sources take significant risks. Risk to their job, their careers, their families, their personal safety, and identifying them could really put them into a world of trouble. So on one hand, you spill the beans and, and identify that person and let that person deal with it then. The other hand, the reporter gets to the end of the line after uh, in the judicial process and then could end up facing jail time. How do you well, someone in tangent, court. tangenting into what this <coughs> poor lady didn't do back 40 years ago and then finally decided to do it, take somewhat touching on that source in uh, <coughs> there? Um, I mean, I don't know what Dr. Ford had been doing <clears throat> as far as dealing with the press over the last 30 years, but uh, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call her a, a confidential source, especially when she's testifying. Not in anymore. Sir. Sure. 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 If you can uh, collaborate a number of confidential sources, they have way more than the court. What was that? If you can collaborate a 
reputable sources. <laughs> um, I mean, reporters do that. You know, they put, they, you know, they, they, they use sources for corroboration, but even then, uh, they, they could still get roped into a, you know, who, you know, who this, you know, a leak investigation. So reporters use confidential sources in a variety of different ways. One is corroboration. And you find something out and then you go to somebody you trust who can confirm it. Uh, another way is, you know, the, the Watergate deep throat uh, guy in the trench coat in the parking garage with an envelope, right? I mean, I, I love all the president's men. It really gives us a, a great window into the reporting. Um, and th th those sources exist too, right? The whistleblower, um, the, the, the person with the chip on his shoulder, uh, person with a conscience who wants the public to know about some sort of wrongdoing. I and mean, those people exist too. And if you, if you, has anybody read the, Wood, the new Woodward book? The new one? The, yeah, Fear. Yeah. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I've read a lot about it and I've seen Woodward on TV about every other day for the last two weeks. Um, but it looks like he used confidential sources in a variety of ways like that. Corroboration, uh, triangulation where, you know, you're not a party to a conversation, but you talk to everybody who was in that conversation and you extrapolate. So that's classic Woodward, classic Woodward. And again, it's going, it goes all the way back to what he did 40 years ago with, with Watergate, the same type of reporting, the same type of uh, critical questioning reporting that exposes uh, wrongdoing or at least some some chicanery or fraud or abuse, whatever we want to label what's going on. But I mean, that's how it's done, right? Now Judith Miller, who uh, was uh, interviewed at, uh, at Berkeley in, in the video, um, you know, she she operated at you know at the national level, covering national security issues. And what was interesting with her case, going back uh, more than ten years, um, she didn't actually write anything that she got in trouble for. She had done an off the record interview with, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the facts, with uh, Dick Cheney's chief of staff, a guy named Scooter Libby, <laughs> a grown up named Scooter, <laughs> and uh, was given competent, it was an off the record interview in which uh, Scooter uh, basically revealed confidential information about Valerie Plame, a secret agent, whose husband had written a a critical editorial in the New York Times <coughs> uh, criticized President Bush and the uh, lead up to the war in Iraq. So um, she didn't actually write anything, yet she was still roped into a grand jury investigation and refused to reveal who her source was, even though she didn't write anything about it. And then ended up going to jail for 85 days uh, for a contempt, you know, contempt of court. and. Um, you know, it, it's it's kind of an interesting issue here, because uh, you know Americans like to, to brag, but we don't send our reporters to jail. No. I've given lectures in I've given lectures in China and, and, and Russia, and I get to go to those places and say, oh, we don't we don't put our reporters in jail. <laughs> but 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 there are these narrow circumstances where reporters have found themselves going to jail, like Judith Miller. And uh, you know, every time the government does one of these leak investigations and gets a reporter on a, a horn, the horns of a dilemma that, that could result in jail time, I think it, it seriously diminishes our, you know, our, 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 our higher role, uh, our higher model uh, purpose with the First Amendment. Because you can't, again, it's procedural, and I've had a room full of lawyers. We could talk about the nuances of how a contempt of court violation ends up roping a reporter into something like this and then getting a reporter thrown in jail. But at the end of the day, it's still a reporter going to jail. And um, uh, it's hard to, it's really hard to say with a straight face to any audience that we don't put our reporters in jail when a reporter ends up in jail, like Judith <laughs> Miller. I, I met Judith Miller at a lunch several years ago in New York City, and she's she's charming. She's very friendly, 
very outgoing, and uh, I mean that, even that, that's after 85 days in federal check. What did the government prove, and what did they get by putting her in jail? Um, what was the, if you ring the register, <coughs> pull the, the slot button down, what did, what was the outcome of all that craziness? It's a warning. I mean, it's a chilling effect, right? It, it, it tells reporters that reporters who are covering high-level national security issues uh, could face trouble. It's also a message to sources and whistleblowers and people of conscience. Now, it just so happened the whistleblower, uh, I hazard to use the term whistleblower with Scooter Libby, but the source, in that case, got his sentence commuted and then later got a presidential pardon. So I guess it depends who the source is. And if you're, if the source, and again, it, it speaks to the political nature of what the underlying story was about. It was, a, it was a, about politi attacking political revenge and using the press to do that. So, um, you know, the message is, I think the message is pretty clear to both the press and potential sources. Because again, at the end of the day, in a federal setting, uh, reporters are really at the whim of a federal judge who uh, is probably uh, looking pretty favorably at a Department of Justice subpoena, right? Um, I mean, again, our reporters are not without <coughs> protections. I mean, the Department of Justice has guidelines that require some level of proof before uh, subpoenaing a reporter, um, all uh, the, the, the Department of Justice has to get the approval of the, the, of the Attorney General, and uh, the DOJ has to show that all other remedies have been exhausted before they subpoena a reporter. Uh, there are little speed bumps, but it's not enough to totally prevent it. And um, again, we talk about the bipartisan nature of some of this some of this stuff. Uh, the Obama administration wasn't much better uh, on this than uh, any of the Republican administrations either. Uh, the conventional wisdom is, and studies and, and scholars have uh, intimated and written that uh, the, the Obama administration had as many as seven active leak investigations going on uh, that would have involved uh, members of the press. So it is a bipartisan issue if we, if we want to be bipartisan about so uh, you know, there, there are speed bumps, but they're easily overcome if the government really has a good case, a compelling case, and that's part of the standard. There has to be a compelling case, a compelling government interest to uh, uncover the information that couldn't be uncovered in any other uh, format. Now, again, that's the federal setting. In a, in a state setting, reporters have um, more protections New York is particularly protective of uh, reporter confidentiality. New York has a uh, shield law that um, protects reporters who reveal, who obtain confidential information. But that's only as good as uh, a county court or uh, you know any state court uh, venue or jurisdiction. So there's good and bad. Every state has some protection except Wyoming. Um, <laughs> investigative reporters in Wyoming have to be careful with uh, their confidential sources. Okay. But uh, again, it, it, it really, it really does uh, raise some concerns for for reporters. Um, you know, reporters don't have the same protections that say lawyers have, or doctors, or clergy members, when it comes to confidentiality. Right? You can always go to never been to confession, but you can go to confession and you know admit that you committed a crime to your priest. And there is no court in the country that would uh, allow that priest to testify, or that would compel that priest to testify. Are, are elected officials held to the same standards, or what? They should be, um, <laughs> but elected officials have executive privilege. They can they can uh, invoke executive privilege. We've seen current administration try to invoke executive privilege with a lot of things, uh, but I don't think you can hide a crime behind executive privilege. But then again, you need to have, you know, 
there's a whole you know, legal constitutional question about whether a, uh, an executive, you know, we're talking executive, whether a sitting executive <coughs> president can be subpoenaed uh, before a grand jury. Even the senators and assemblymen are yeah. not just thinking the executives. Yeah. Um, I mean, some senators, I mean, my, I'm from New Jersey. I, I've obviously been in Syracuse for a long time, but I grew up in New Jersey, and one of the senators in New Jersey actually had a, a criminal trial. And that might end up derailing his reelection, but uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a criminal setting, obviously you can't compel a, a defendant to, to testify, but uh, you can certainly. Um, Base a subpoena, even if you happen to be a, a sitting government official. I mean, the tighter question is with the you know, sitting president, and we saw that play out with uh, <clears throat> with President Clinton during some of his scandals as well. So, what does that leave us with? You know, we saw uh, the outrage from the administration after the Woodward book came out and after the anonymous column in the New York Times came out, and uh, there were initial calls that the president was gonna direct the FBI and the Department of Justice to convene, convene an investigation, and um, you know, the next uh, news cycle uh, replaced that with some other scandal. <coughs> so, um, you know, perhaps the, the fluid nature of current events keeps uh, the press somewhat indemnified from some of these uh, uh, attempts to, or at least uh, vocal attempts to uh, rein, the, rein in the press. Uh, so far, you know, two years into the administration, uh, we've dealt with a lot of rhetoric, and so far it's really just been rhetoric. It, uh, you know, it's a, it, the rhetoric seems to be a, a mechanism or a tool to discredit the message, to discredit the messenger, and to foment uh, his base, <coughs> to rile up the base. And uh, you know, if you discredit the information that's being disseminated, then people don't pay attention to it anymore. But you know, you know, fake news banner uh, ha is still being attached, but it's sort of losing its luster as well. However, it's become it's gone viral, and we've seen uh, leaders in other countries invoke uh, the fake news uh, doctrine, if we want to even call it that, to discredit the news. And uh, I mean, it's a it sends the message. Right? It sends the message that uh, the, the journalism, the, the press, uh, shouldn't be trusted or even paid attention to. That message seems to be working, at least with a portion of the population. But um, you know, I don't know where we would be without a, a free, independent press right now. Mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to fathom where we would be or think about where we would be because um, you know, we're, that's where we, we're learning what we need to learn and what we need to know. And uh, that seems to be the only check on, on power right now. Mm -hmm. So on that high note, I'd be happy to field some questions and uh, do the best that I can with your, with your questions, if you have any. Yes, sir. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, two quick little points, uh, two bits, and then the question. Uh, you were mentioning how uh, you know the exemptions from testifying are present for uh, doctors and clergy, et cetera, and that clergy for, uh, prerogative of uh, the uh, sanctity of the confessional uh, is right now being challenged in Louisiana uh, around the uh, child uh, uh, sexual abuse laws. I don't know where that will go, but it will be interesting to see how that is either decided on a state level or how that will conflict with the constitutional or other kinds of religious protections. But uh, that's what I've been reading in different press about how oh, that's being considered now in Louisiana. I don't know if you know anything about that. Yeah, I, I don't know much about what's going on in Louisiana. Yeah, but, <laughs> but that, that's going to be an interesting test case, I think. Uh, secondly, on the First Amendment itself, as you probably know from my reading about it, uh, 
and, and obviously we revere that <clears throat> as being uh, critically fundamental and important, but it was not proposed as the First Amendment. It was really the Third Amendment that was proposed, as I understand it. The first two, one had to do with representation, which was rejected, and another was some kind of obscure tax, and it was the Third Amendment, but it was just the first two were kind of narrowly defeated, and then it ended up the First Amendment. Is that understanding correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Madison, James Madison, the principal author of the First Amendment, had proposed two really mechanical First First Amendments. And I mean, one was about apportionment of the House of Representatives, and the other had something to do with, I think, salaries of, um, of uh, public officials or, or, or Congress. Um, you know, every time, every time I, I talk about that or read about that, I always think that it was Madison just <laughs> Putting a couple things out there just to get them deliberately rejected, I think it was, I think it was strategic. Because if you really look at the the rest of the Bill of Rights, those two initial first first proposals really bear no resemblance to any of the civil rights that are protected anywhere in the Bill of Rights. Uh, when you talk about know, second, first, we, the first that we have with speech, press, religion, assembly, and uh, government and then second gun rights I'm not talking don't ask me gun stuff I don't want any about guns so uh, third amendment quartering soldiers and then you know fourth with freedom of search and, from search and seizure fifth due process and self-incrimination and then we get into the jail and, and, and criminal pro criminal uh, amendment so really you know the civil rights and the human rights that are protected throughout most of the Bill of Rights really bear no resemblance to the two mechanical uh, proposals that Madison first had. And I just think that was pure strategy, just to let people, give people a chance to reject something and then we'll get to the heavy business. But I have no, I've got no uh, scholarly uh, material to back up my, my thoughts on that. Probably need to read another book. Uh, thank you so much. The question specifically though that I was wondering about in terms of the current situation with uh, Judge Kavanaugh and the accusations. Uh, can you think of any way, uh, I understand that the, according to this morning's news, the FBI report is not going to be made public. Now we expect, I expect that that will leak somehow. But do you have any thoughts about that, whether or not there is some right uh, within some constitutional, within the amendment or something else, for that report to be made available to the American um, again, uh, in revealing the report would fall under um, uh, Freedom of Information Act, uh, FOIA law, and um, I could I could see the FBI invoking one or two of the nine exceptions as justification for not revealing it to the public. Um, but I don't think that would be a legitimate invocation of the of of the. Um, exceptions, I, I would believe that it, this should be something the American public should have access to, and um, you know, we'll see what happens, mm -hmm. but, yeah. If neither, if you want to read the account, if neither of the parties, Christine Ford or Brett Kavanaugh, have been interviewed for this, technically they are the sources, and uh, you know, they're involved, so technically, who's the fit, they are? That might, we don't know who the FBI is going to be interviewing or who they, who well, they, they have. Well, they say they haven't been interviewed for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that might be a reason why they wouldn't want to reveal the, the contents of the investigation. From what I've seen on, on CNN and read in the paper, it looks like it's going to be a pretty thin uh, investigative report anyway. Mm -hmm. So. Um, in 2007, when New House 3 was dedicated, wrapped in the First Amendment, I, Dean Rubin had asked me to be the liaison with John Roberts. So he was a speaker, he was a featured person. So later that, in June, we had the privilege of going and having a private tour to the Supreme Court. And we wound up, he, he asked to see us, so we wound up five of us in his office. And among them was my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, my 
Christian Law was a 30-year reporter for NBC, had been the our, our producer, had been the executive producer of Meet the Press. My brother-in-law was a retired, long-time congressional aide, very connected, living in Bethesda. So what was interesting is that John Roberts lived in Bethesda, and the conversation quickly became about Bethesda people, common people. So I'm thinking of Kavanaugh from Bethesda. I, I don't know if he still lives there. Yeah. And I'm wondering what John Roberts is feeling, what the other justices are feeling. They, they're seeing what we're seeing. They're reading what we're reading. And would they ever speak up to the president? Would, they, would uh, Roberts ever say, this man is unacceptable to join the Supreme Court? Can I take your temperature? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's high. I, I understand. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think it would be appropriate for the Chief Justice of the United States to have a conversation with the President. Um, you know, they are separate branches of government, uh, each with a constitutional mandate, and um, you know, that independence is, uh, is there for a reason. So I think it would be highly inappropriate for uh, any, any cross-communications uh, cross between any branches. I mean, obviously, Congress and the President have to communicate, and that's, you know, that's part of the nature of, of, of lawmaking. But um, you know, the court is a, is a cloistered, independent uh, branch of government, and it would be highly suspect if the, if the Chief Justice had any sort of conversation with anybody. And I've, I've met six Supreme Court justices uh, with this thing I do in Washington. I've had conversations with Chief Justice Roberts. Um, a couple of occasions, and uh, I've read a lot about him, and I've seen a lot of news coverage about him. He, he, he sees him, I think he sees himself as the lead guardian of, of, of the court in many ways, and um, this sort of circus, I think, could diminish the court's reputation and independence, and, um, and independent Nonpartisan patina. I mean, you know, the court likes to say it's not a political branch, but um, it's increasingly becoming a political branch. And uh, I mean, that's more of a judicial political philosophy, whether the court's political or not. Um, but it's becoming less and less um, nonpartisan, and it's because of nominations like like this. So, I mean, it, I, I would love to have candid conversations with the justices. There's probably at least one justice who uh, sympathizes with, uh, uh, with what Kavanaugh's going through. <laughs> so there'll be at least a conservative voting bloc that'll have a uh, shared uh, confirmation experience. Of course, justice, I'm talking about Justice Thomas, but um, I don't know. I mean, and, and it would be interesting to really have a uh, candid conversation with uh, people who are now going to be in the majority, and you know, by, you know, when, when decisions are, uh, when significant legal decisions are coming down to you know one vote in a you know a nine-member court, you want to be in the majority. So I think, and I, and I think this has been part of the uh, the, the Republican Party's. Compromise with with the Trump with, with the Trump circus, right? They want they want the votes, they want the court, they want the justices, they want the the, the government scaled back, and uh, they obviously you know, the party of family values is obviously overlooking you know, a, a history of. They knew what they were getting. They knew who he was. They knew the baggage he was bringing with him to the White House. And I think the conservatives uh, looked the other way on a lot of that so they could get the majority. You think they, this is very political, but do you, do you think they ever expected to get as much of what they got, <laughs> <laughs> they expected to get something 
Give me the bigger swamp. <laughs> exactly. I mean, who ever expected, and this is, it has very little to do with the freedoms. <coughs> who ever expected that with this, this pool of, excuse my language, cats would come flying at us every day? Who ever thought that we were going to be exposed and encumbered with what's happening to us? And maybe it has to do with freedoms. The last few days, uh, Trump, I can, can't even bring this up to say the word president, because I think I'm president. But the last few days, he's been, and I just knew something bad was going to happen, because he, he started saying that Dr. Ford was, you know, she seems like a nice woman, and, you know, and all of a sudden he's being very pleasant about the whole thing. Then he went to a rally, I mean, was it in Georgia? Mississippi. Mississippi. Okay. He went to a rally there and he trashed her unbelievably. Well, her lawyer did respond. But so I'm wondering, as a citizen, what can be done about a man who actually thinks maybe he's going to run for president again? What are there groups around where we can do things without ending up in jail? <laughs> because really, coming to the whole thing, we hear this every day, it's upsetting to hear it, and yet you feel so helpless. And so I'm wondering, in your professional opinion and in talking with your colleagues, um, is there anything that we can possibly do? Start groups, whatever. Vote. Vote. Besides vote. Get other of course I vote. vote. I mean, I wouldn't be sitting here. But the point is, what else can we do that's more active? Campaign. In, and right, and find people to do this with, and um, I mean, he is just an abomination. <laughs> right the, side side of the, paper. Yeah. the best part about it is you, you've got the freedom right now to say what you just said in front of certain yeah. other people. But if I, said it, if I said it, if I said it, well, actually, people do say things with us in Ottawa, so. You know, you can call in for there. Um, but if you were just to go there and stand around there in the White House with signs, which people have done too, and then he just continues on. So I can understand why his wife probably wanted to go to Africa. <laughs> um, I'm very concerned. Well, it'll be a relief to her. <laughs> I'm very concerned about the decline of checks and balances. Uh, especially looking at what the Supreme Court is going to be. Uh, is, is, Congress, is Congress the only uh, uh, recourse is for Congress to pass a law to overturn a ruling by the Supreme Court? Can then the Supreme Court uh, declare their uh, law unconstitutional? How do we keep the checks and balances that was meant to be? That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> you know, even after um, even after the Supreme Court rules on a case, Congress can uh, draft laws, but uh, you know that would probably require a shift in in Congress to get more uh, left leaning or uh, you know, democratic type laws passed. Hopefully. But then, you know, the Supreme Court can't just go back and invalidate a, a rule. There has to be a, a case, there has to be a case and a challenge, and it has to go all the way through the court system. So, uh, you know, at least uh, with certain things, it's not instantaneous. You know, change doesn't happen instantly. Uh, there has to, there, there is still a process. You haven't mentioned social media, and. Uh, how can you, if you say something on social media, which might be considered libelous, or at least the question. No, you can you can still defame somebody on social media. Yeah, and then what? Is uh, anybody can somebody bring a case against? You? Yeah, I mean if you if you uh, if you defame me, if you say I'm a criminal or a, whatever, I'm not going to defame myself in front of an audience, but <laughs> yeah. for illustration purposes, if you call me a criminal on your Twitter feed. 
Yeah. And I mean, I can sue you. I don't know how much, I, but that becomes more of a private action rather than a uh, big press case. Uh, because I, I, I couldn't sue Twitter. You Social, could, you can't I could not. You could not sue them. Twitter, Facebook, um, platforms that allow, eBay, YouTube, these, these platforms that allow third party uh, content have federal immunity. There's actually a specific law uh, under the Communications Decency Act that identifies <coughs> these, uh, these entities from litigation. But okay. I, can, I can see the hell out of somebody that. But that doesn't them. include the, the major networks. Or the media no. doesn't include no. the newspaper, doesn't even include the new house school. No, no, I mean, again, there's still, there's still liability, uh, publisher liability, whether you're NBC News okay. or Syracuse.com or the New York Times. Again, if you're, if you're producing content, you can still be liable, you can still be responsible for, for that content. It's just social media that would not, yes. Well, one sad thing about keeping watch on government is the decline of the fourth estate. I mean, there's, for example, the Daily News, 50% laid off of their newsroom, or, or what the uh, Post Standard has gone through. I mean, the press today is vastly diminished in, in watching. Excuse me. That is a financial situation yeah. where advertisers have left those medias, so that financial wherewithal yes. is not there to support a, a separate part called the journalism or the reporting part. That's what's happened. It, it's not a matter of discourse, it's a matter of finances. Oh, it is, but it, it impacts on <coughs> that too, what yeah. he's presented. Yeah. Results the same? Yeah, it ends up the same. Yeah, I, I, I lament that as well. I mean, I, I still subscribe to the Post Standard all three days a week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, when you can get it two days ahead of time on Syracuse.com. Uh, yeah, I mean, but I'm, I'm also checking in on Syracuse.com like five times a day as well. Um, but it's not simply in, in, you know, it's endemic to, to Syracuse. It's happening all over the country. And um, I mean, it's a double-edged sword. I mean, there, 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 are, there have been some benefits to digitization and, uh, and, and online content. But at the end of the day, it's not generating the same profit margin that uh, the old uh, newspaper advertising generated. And until until media companies can figure out how to make more money, we're, you know, we're, we're in the situation where we're in. I think one of the dangers is the fact that the demise of the newspaper, which we all grew up with, and now you have the younger generation who are getting their news from various sources and where some of it is not being checked. And uh, what, what, what that holds for the future and how they make their decisions is really going to be very, is, is scary. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, my, my grandchildren don't read the newspaper. And they probably, uh, they, <laughs> and they don't watch TV. They don't watch the TV, you know. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, we, we, we're in a precarious position right now. Where, I mean, and even people that are uh, media consumers uh, tend to get content from the sites that they agree with. So, uh, you know, the fractured um, media environment that we live in now is delivering content uh, to people that they want, that they want delivered to them. So I don't I don't have the answer. I mean, news literacy is a is something that we have to be concerned about. I, I think um, you know, getting uh, people to have access and be critical readers of information um, is important. Um, I mean, I don't know where people get information. I that, that's the million dollar question right now. I mean, Just a couple days ago. At a press conference, President denigrated two female reporters yeah. right? and insulted them. And I'm surprised the press didn't pick up on that. The next day, the headlines in the paper should be, How dare you, Mr. President? You, you denigrated the press and females at the same time. Well, he's doubling down. 
<laughs> he doesn't care. And, and the public, I mean, the public, I don't think the public cares. And I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a narrow, a slippery slope on that because reporters don't like to be the story. So, you know, should the headline be that the president denigrated a reporter? I mean, that happens. Reporters get denigrated. I've been denigrated. When I was a reporter, people yelled at me. Mayors yelled at me. It was they went with the territory. But it was more substantive. It wasn't personal. And it wasn't based on you know, immutable characteristics or misogyny or anything like that. So, and we learn about it, but it's almost we're almost numb to it at this point as well. What effect do you see in your New House students? If they're still a newspaper magazine major, where how are they responding to what they're seeing? Um, we're still getting students. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, in these types of crises, I've, I've heard that journalism uh, school applications are up, um, but um, the opportunities aren't there. So we, we'll, we'll train people, we'll educate people, and then ask them to take a you know a job that's not going to pay a, a lot uh, in a place that probably isn't close to home. So you know we're still seeing people interested, but it's got a short shelf life in, afterwards. Uh, you really have to want to do the job uh, afterwards uh, after you graduate. Big ask. I mean, you've got uh, student debt. You've got this disrespect that we're, we're facing, and it, 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 it grinds it. It grinds you out. So, uh, you know, luckily, we still have students who want to be journalists. We we have uh, at Newhouse. We've got two journalism majors now. We recently merged our magazine and newspaper departments, which is also a sign of the times. We also have a broadcast department. Uh, so you know, we still have opportunities, and we're still training people, but um, we'll see how long they can last in, in the business. Do you teach any of the ethics courses? I don't, I mean, I teach law. I teach what you can do, not what you should do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that on the first day of class. We don't, it's not about ethics. Although you can't have a conversation about what you can't do without having the ethical uh, uh, issues pop up. I think we got uh, one one last <coughs> question. And I don't know if you kind of answered this. Uh, would it be possible? I'm not saying I believe this, but the uh, uh, for Dr. Lansing Ford to be accused of libel to of Judge Kavanaugh because of her contention, uh, saying 100 percent, I'm sure. Now, um, you know, uh, a judicial hearing is a uh, privileged venue so uh, the um, the law would support open wide open and honest communications in a judicial hearing or a congressional hearing or a, a government setting like that so uh, she would be immune from liability 